Hey y'all, Michael Malekade here for ENL3, Intro to Literature, Being Human in a More Than Human World. For week one, we're reading three poems. Um, maybe you've already read them, hopefully, I think. You should read them before checking out this video. Uh, it's Amy Nijuka Matatil's Corpse Flower, James Wright's Lying in a Hammock on William Duffy's Farm in Pine Island, Minnesota. You should really look up the title next time. Uh, and finally, W.B. Yeats's poem, The Indian Upon God. That's the subject of this video today. So if you haven't read the Yeats poem yet, uh, take a minute to read it to yourself before I, I read it and talk about it. So Yeats was an Irish poet and playwright in the end of the 19th century through the first half of the 20th century. Uh, he wrote a lot, lot of poems. And plays. I've got his collected poems right here. Pretty thick book. Um, so the poem we're going to be talking about, The Indian Upon God, is first of all a persona poem. Uh, that's a term that we might re return to a couple times this quarter. It means that the poem is written from the persona of someone other than the poet themselves. So it's written from the voice of a character. Sometimes Persona poems are written in the voice of real historical figures. Sometimes they're written in famous fictional characters. Sometimes a little less clearly defined here. The persona that is speaking the poem is uh, told to us in the title, The Indian Upon God. Because we know a little bit about W.B. Yeats, uh, what he wrote about, what he was interested in, who he was, stuff like that, uh, we can be pretty sure when he says Indian, he means a person from the country or subcontinent, India, and not uh, Native American. Just so we're all on the same page. Cool, so I'm going to read the poem aloud. Uh, when we read poems for this class, or just in general, it's always good to read them aloud. Try to find recordings of the poet reading them aloud if you can. Uh, Yeats, I actually haven't looked for recordings of Yeats, but, you know... I don't think that they recorded a lot of poems in the 1890s. Shouldn't say that on a video I'm posting online, because somebody will prove me wrong. I don't know. Uh, listen to the poem being read aloud. Read it aloud yourself. And hear the rhythm, rhythms and sounds of it as well. Yeats, the Indian upon God. The Indian Upon God I passed along the water's edge below the humid trees. My spirit rocked in evening light, the rushes round my knees. My spirit rocked in sleep and sighs, and saw the moorfowl pace all dripping on a grassy slope, and saw them cease to chase each other around in circles, and heard the eldest speak. Who holds the world between his bill and made us strong or weak is an undying moorfowl, and he lives beyond the sky. The rains are from his dripping wing, the moonbeams from his eye. I passed a little further on and heard a lotus talk. Who made the world and ruleth it? He hangeth on a stalk, for I am in his image made. And all this tinkling tide is but a sliding drop of rain between his petals wide. A little way within the gloom, a roebuck raised his eyes, brimful of starlight, and he said, The stamper of the skies, he is a gentle roebuck, for how else, I pray, could he conceive a thing so sad and soft, a gentle thing like me? I passed a little further on and heard a peacock say, Who made the grass and made the worms and made my feathers gay? He is a monstrous peacock, and he waveth all the night his languid tail above us, lit with myriad spots of light. That's Yeats. Um, so... I want to talk about a few things that I noticed while reading the poem, make some observations towards building some analytical ideas about the poem, and raise some questions for further consideration. So first of all, one of the things to notice about this poem uh, is that it reports the speech of others. 
Not only is it a persona poem who's spoken by this fictional character from India, uh, that character, that speaker within the poem, reports the speech of a moorfowl, a lotus, a roebuck, and a peacock. So much of the poem is dialogue. It's written in the speech of these other creatures. That's interesting to me. I wonder uh, what the effects of that are, what that helps the poem do, why sandwich these ideas about God or about religion in the voice of these creatures as reported by the, the Indian upon God, the title's persona character, as reported by the poet W.B. Yeats. There's a lot of kind of layers or kind of concentric circles uh, of speech going on in the poem. So I'm interested in that. Another thing to note about the poem, obviously, is that animals and plants have experiences in the poem. They're able to use language to some extent to report their experiences to the speaker of the poem. Um, and they're each speaking in particular of their experiences of God, and they each have their own experience of God. So that's you know, before we get into what exactly they're saying about God, that's already a, a pretty striking and unusual thing. Um, the poet, the poem, is suggesting that plants and animals are sentient beings, are spiritual beings, that they have ways of perceiving reality around them and making sense of it. And this obviously is a much different idea or ideology than we're used to in modern scientific worldviews. It's also very different from traditional Judeo-Christian monotheist perspectives. Usually in at least the Judeo-Christian traditions, animals and plants not really often thought of as spiritual beings who have their own relationships to God. So Yeats uh, an Irish dude writing in a very Catholic nation at the end of the 19th century, this poem says things not only about God, but about nature, about animals and plants that would have been highly unusual and possibly even heretical or strange. So there's that. Then, obviously, the poem is reporting some different ideas about God, about religion. And so if we look at some of the, the details to see what is it this poem is saying about religion exactly or about God. And we see that each animal or plant, uh, there's a couple birds, a land animal, an ungulate maybe, I don't know what a what class a robot fits, a land animal. Uh, and a, a plant, the lotus as well. So each of these creatures is envisioning God as being a reflection of them, of their own being and their own way of life. So the Moorfowl says that God holds the world in his bill uh, and that the rains are just water drip, or yeah, rains are just water dripping from God's wing. Moonbeams are just light reflecting from God's Moorfowlish eye. And so God is a reflection of more foul, a really big more foul, and each creature sees God in their own way. So this gives us multiple images of what God might be like, um, and it also strikes me that the creatures are using their own ways of interacting with the world to think about God, and they're using the idea of God to explain what's going on in their own reality around them. So the more foul explains what rain is by appealing to this idea of God being a, a more foul flying out of water and water dripping from its wing. And we see that for each of the creatures. So there's some relationship between how we think about religion and how we think about or perceive reality, uh, how we explain the events around us, the poem is telling us. Um, if I were analyzing this poem in more depth, writing an essay about it, I might ask, what is the relationship between uh, perception and reality in this poem? Or what is the relationship between what the poem is saying about animals and plants on the one hand? What is its ecology, its environmental theory on the one hand? 
and on the other hand, what it's saying about God and spirituality. Is there some connection between thinking of animals and plants this way and thinking of God in this way? So that's what I might ask. Another thing I might think about, since I know Yeats is a dude writing from Ireland or the UK uh, and writing about what his imagination of what it means to be Indian, I might ask uh, how different European ideas and representations of India and Indianness are being represented in this poem. How is the poem interacting with uh, the exchange of ideas, especially spiritual ideas, between Europe and India through colonial interactions and the colonization of India. I might think a little bit about um, whether this poem's ideas about God are more drawing on Hindu traditions of pantheist or panentheist or even polytheist traditions of Hinduism, or if the poem's ideas of God are actually still Judeo-Christian ideas of God. Did Yeats successfully capture Indian ideas about spirituality in this poem, or did he just replicate British, Irish, colonialist ideas both about spirituality and about Indians? So there's a lot of questions to ask about this poem, and there are no easy answers. That's going to be uh, a trend and a theme in our class this quarter. There's no right answer exactly when we're trying to make sense of these complex, layered texts. I look forward to seeing what you all have to say about Corpse Flower in Weekly Forum Post number one. Uh, and if you have some thoughts about W.B. Yeats's poem, feel free to leave them in the comments here or email me. Uh, or even weave them into your weekly forum posts that I want you to focus mostly on Nizhugmatatil's Corpse Flower. Thanks, y'all.